Good morning, good morning, and good morning again. Uh-oh. I got to make some last-second arrangements <laughs> as we get started this morning. Uh, I'm glad that everyone is able to be with us this morning. I hope everything is going well. Just a couple of minutes behind. By saying a couple of minutes, really about five minutes behind. So I did come on a little bit late. I uh, appreciate all of your patience. Uh, nothing bad went on. It's just that I was running behind, that's all. If I was on time, all the time, I guess I'd be a computer. So I do have your messages. We are getting started. It is now 9.30. But if you don't mind, we'll go just a few minutes behind, give everyone an opportunity to catch on. So we'll start at about 9.35 this morning just to give everyone an opportunity to get settled and to come online once again excuse my tardiness there's a lot of moving targets going on here but the one thing i do want to do as i say good morning to all of you uh the one thing i do want to do is to make sure that um, i set my timer here i try to help myself out and all of us to be mindful of the time. So we're going to say, eh, there we go. Let's start that. So once again, uh, I haven't gone over this yet, but our lesson this morning is coming from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 1. Then we'll take verses 4 to 15. Now we're making it, have made it actually to the last unit which is entitled Courage for Jesus. Uh, and this morning, we're going to look at how, uh, wait a minute, courage facing threats. Excuse me. That tells you what kind of morning it's been. And so the new unit is going to begin on the 15th, which is the third Sunday. They normally begin on the first Sunday, but uh, the lesson this morning is entitled Jeremiah Stands Up to Deadly Threats, still in the unit speaking about courage facing threats and so because we are in the last month of this sunday school quarter it's time to start ordering our new sunday school books uh, you can get a hold of brother Lonnie or tim that information is going to be posted soon by uh, via the church website or the church facebook page and you'll be able to get your books uh, for our next unit which will begin the first sunday in september uh, as normal, the Sunday School books are $7 for the regular print, and they are $8.50 for the large print. And some of our seniors prefer the larger print. It just makes it easier when it comes to reading uh, the text of Scripture from the Sunday School lesson. And for those that are willing and those that are able, we would invite you to purchase one or two extra books, regular print or large print, whichever one. Uh, best suits you. That way we can have some books left over for people that may join the church or for people who just may not have it at this time. And I say that that is in no way uh, we don't want to look down on anyone. I think if you're not independently wealthy, then you know what it's like to not have. I mean, it, it may be $5 or $10 but if you don't have it, it may as well be a million dollars. So hopefully we'll be able to give to someone who is in need, may be able to use it as an evangelistic tool, or just to help somebody that doesn't have the opportunity to purchase one at this time, or maybe they've forgotten. We want to be of uh, assistance to those who we can be assistance to, particularly our seniors. So we're going to go ahead and get started here in just a couple of minutes. I'll give us to about 9.35. Um, and then we'll pick up. I'm going to make sure I get everything lined out here. And this morning we have a good lesson. I, I, I pray that all of you have had a good rest. But our lesson this morning has a lot of uh, practical application that we can kind of glean from the, the biblical text. Something that can be of a great benefit to us in our daily walk with the Lord. So I want to encourage you, if you can, to go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. Or if you have the adult book, looks like the lesson it's coming from page 116 and following. So to all of you, good morning. To Reverend and Sister Austin, to my Aunt Nett, to the Tim's family, uh, to the Milam family, God bless you as well. Brother Alfonso Brown, God bless you. 
I'm sure there are some others whose names I have not yet seen. I'm kind of fumbling around, moving a whole bunch of stuff, uh, things around at this time. And please don't forget that today is uh, our first Sunday. So at the conclusion of our message for our morning uh, service, we will have our communion. And I pray that you uh, all have that communion um, uh, with you, that communion packet that we give out. Uh, if not, uh, you can use other items in your home. And I don't say that in any way to be comical. If you just have a cracker and some water, it's the symbolism that's count because we're not using real wine and we're not using the original bread that Christ used uh, during that time anyway. So any other items uh, can be a, um, here it is right here. It can be a good substitute for you as well. So we've made it to 930, 935, excuse me. We're about five minutes off. I was a bit coming on, uh, came on a bit late this morning. So if you have the opportunity, I wanna ask you to, to pause. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go further or we'll begin with our Sunday school lesson for this morning. So if you can, let's, let's pray together as we get started. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, giving us a new day. Thank you for bringing us to the first day in a new month. God, we pray that you will uh, equip us. We pray that you can give us an understanding mind and heart. Help us, Lord, as we go through your word. Lord, not to go into it haphazardly or to take it lightly, but to take a serious and sober look into what your word says. Father, we ask you now that you can guide the lesson, that your spirit can be the real teacher, that he will be able to give us insight into your word. And I pray, Lord, that you can use me in some way to be a benefit to the kingdom in teaching your lesson and teaching your word to your people. We thank you for the ones who are with us, for the ones that may see this down the road. And we just pray, Lord, that something can be sung to enlighten their heart, to give them a look towards you. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Sister Lucretha Brown, good morning to you. I guess I'll go ahead and have some of this coffee since I have it here with me this morning. Uh, one of the things that will be missed personally is when we do get back into our regular swing of things, we know that time will come. Don't know when, but we know it will come. But when we do get back into the swing of things, I won't be able to be in the pulpit with my coffee. So I will take full advantage of this while we have the opportunity. Uh, if you have a moment, let's go ahead and turn to Jeremiah uh, chapter 26. We're going to look at verses 1, then we're going to skip to verses 4 through 15. Uh, because of the time frame that we have, I'm not going to read the verses in totality. What I will do is I'm going to read them as we cover them in our Sunday school lesson. Now, our book has a wonderful uh, outline and illustration for today's lesson. And we're going to go ahead and just dive into Jeremiah chapter 26. And let's all look collectively at verse 1. And what it does is, it this verse, usually the beginning verses of chapters, especially when there's a new narrative or a new uh, uh, situation that takes place, usually what happens is, uh, the first verse is kind of an opening verse to give us the scene, and that's what we have here this morning. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse 1, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word of the Lord saying, now this just tells us, this is who was in power when this happened. This is who was in charge when these events that we are about to cover, uh, this is who was in charge when these events uh, had taken place. Now, what we want to do in verse one is we want to look at Jehoiakim, uh, Kim, excuse me, who is the son of Josiah, and Josiah was the king, but now his son is beginning to take over. Uh, on page 118 of our lesson, uh, for the lesson, uh, in the, today's lesson, we jump back in time about 150 years before Nehemiah began rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We are at the beginning, it says in verse 1, of the reign of Jehoiakim, 
uh, probably this is his first year. Jehoiakim was the son of King Josiah, which verse 1 tells us, who was, Josiah was, the last godly king of Judah before they went into exile. So before they went into exile, they had kings after King Josiah. His son is one, but what we're seeing here is that the father, Josiah, was the last godly king uh, before they went into Babylonian exile. Now what happened was, was that uh, um, Jeremiah began his ministry about halfway through Josiah, who's the son, Josiah's reign. And he lamented the former king's death when he perished uh, in an ill-advised battle against one of the pharaohs of Egypt at the time. So he went into battle with an Egyptian pharaoh, ill-advised, he was killed in that battle. And what the pharaoh of Egypt did, he superseded who was supposed to be the next king and he installed Jehoiakim as the king of Judah, the king of this particular group of tribes. This wicked Pharaoh put in charge this son of, of Josiah, who is Jehoiakim. Now, he was such a threat to Jeremiah. He rebelled against God so much. He took some of the writings of Jeremiah, he cut them up, and then he burned them. He did that to show his contempt towards God, his contempt toward the word of the Lord, his contempt toward spiritual authority, his contempt toward the prophet or God's man. He was certainly not a godly king. So what we're seeing is that Jeremiah is prophesying now not under the leadership of someone that is friendly towards him, someone that has sympathy or a soft heart toward biblical things, but this is a king who is certainly uh, against the Lord, against spiritual rule, against obedience to God. But there's one aspect from verse one I wanted to bring up. You have a godly king for all intents and purposes, we would believe, he had a model of godliness that he set in the home. No doubt he tried to teach and instill in his son, all of his children, you know, biblical values, we would say. He tried to teach them to do things the way that God would have them to do things. And in spite of his modeling, in spite of him directly trying to teach them from a godly home, you still have an ungodly king. From a godly parentage, a mother that loves God, a father that loves God, two parents that try their best to model it, no one is going to do that perfectly. Amen, somebody. But you can see the attempt to teach your children to pray. You don't drop them off at church. You take them to church. You pray with them. You instill biblical values to the best of your ability. But there does come a time to where your child has to make their own decisions. Every tub sits on its own bottom. And when you come from a godly home where you have seen how biblical, uh, how a marriage should be, you have seen how you can handle anger and grief. You have had examples of going to the scripture, going to God in prayer through crises and even going to God in prayer in good times. When you come from that situation and you choose to rebel and go the other way, well, the punishment is much greater for you. Because even in the New Testament, Jesus says that those that don't know, they'll be beaten with a few stripes. Yeah, you're not off the hook. Ignorance does not make you exempt. But those that know and don't do will be beaten with many stripes. So we can already see that this new king, his new reign, Jehoiakim, he's headed in the wrong direction already. So we can kind of see the type of man that he is, the type of character or lack thereof that he is missing. He is not a godly king. So at this time is when the Lord spoke to Jeremiah, and I want you to tell them this. And let's look at verse 4. 
verse 4, 5, and 6. And this is God giving this, these people a warning. He says in verse 4, Jeremiah 26, And you shall say to them, and let me pause, If I don't say thou and therefore and wherefore, please bear with me. That is just difficult for me. The King James Version just really can twist me up in places. So when it says thou, it means you. I think all of us can keep up with that. But we're reading from the King James Version. So verse 4, 5, and 6. And you shall say unto them, this, saith, this is what the Lord says. If you will listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to my word, to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not hearkened. This then, verse 6, will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So God is coming out straightforward. God is giving the people a warning. That's the, the part of our lesson entitles it a warning. In essence, if you obey me, things will be much better for you. If you disobey me, not only will it just be bad, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make this, just. I'm going to make your house, your homes, your nation, just like I did in Shiloh. Now, in reading through the lesson, we don't know specifically what God did in Shiloh. We don't have to know. We get the gist of it. More importantly, they knew. God gave these words to Jeremiah, his prophet, to tell the people, if you obey me, things will be much better for you. But you haven't obeyed me. If you continue to disobey me, punishment will come. Punishment is on the way. And just as a general rule, in our obedience to God, can't we see that when we obey, when we say yes to God, or when we say no to what God says not to do, can we not see that things are much better for us when we obey the Lord? Doesn't mean that when you obey, you won't have heartaches. Doesn't mean that when you obey, you won't have difficulties. Does not mean that when you obey, you won't cry sometime. Because yes, you will suffer pain. You will suffer trials. We'll go through something. But it does mean that just having a clean conscience, just knowing that what I'm going through is not a result of God's hand against me. Because when God puts his hand against you, when God is against you, who can you call to get him off of you? Who can you plead your case to to assist you? The answer is no one. Our lesson gives us some good information about this type of situation. Uh, page 118, it says, Jeremiah was not left to guess what the message should be to his people, to God's people. The Lord gave him the exact words to say. The Lord uh, put, it, put the words in his mouth. It was not a complicated message. Either they were to obey and reap the benefits, or they were going to disobey and reap the burdens of that. Now, now that's kind of a larger picture of the same type of situation that the new king had to line up with. Uh, Jehoiakim. If you obey, things will be better. If you listen and obey to what the Lord says do, things will go smoother. If you choose to rebel, then you do so at your own peril. The, the, the Bible says it this way in the book of Psalms. It says the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Well, he may be a fool, but he's not the biggest fool. The biggest fool is the one who knows that there is a God, but chooses to live like there is no God. Now, these are God's people. These are all Hebrews. These are all Jews. All of them have been exposed to all of the things that have been passed down orally. The miracles, freeing them from Egyptian bondage, Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob, Moses, the lineage just goes on and on and on. They have been exposed to the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the power, the punishment of God. They know that God means business. They know that God says what he means and means what he says. So how could they, in spite of all that they know, still choose to disobey a God that's this good to them? Instead of us trying to answer that question for them, how can we, who know what we know about God, how can we, who will just use a general uh, uh, analogy, who've been brought up in the church, you still shacking. You, you, you know what God's word says, and you still taking money from work. You know what you were brought up, your grandparents, your mother and father, they taught you the word, they prayed with you, they took you to church. How can us who live in a country where you can openly declare that you're a Christian, Christian radio, Christian TV, granted everything is not true that's being spewed out over the airwaves and on the you know, live stream. Yes, there's bad doctrine out there. But my point is we are so inundated to where we can have the Bible on our phone, on our computer, at work most of the time, in our car, on the radio, on TV, on the internet. How is it for us who've been brought up in that type of environment, we still choose to go wrong? You see, when somebody goes down the road and they have a wreck and they come back up the hill saying, don't go that way, the bridge is out, and you say, no, nah, I think I can make it, and you barrel down the highway, well, that makes you even more foolish than the first person who went down the road and had the wreck. And it's even sad that Israel has gotten so low that God would even have to say this to them. It, it, it's even, it, it's a sad commentary on where they have fallen to, to where after all he has done, all the doors he opened. Listen, just the principle of God miraculously feeding them when they wandered in the wilderness. God gave them a cake-like substance that was on the ground, safe to eat, germ-free, called manna. The Hebrew word for manna means, what is this? Literally, that's what it's mean. Google it, do your own research. The word manna means, what is this? They had no way to describe it. God supernaturally miraculously fed them every day, every, and, and listen, didn't even have to hunt for it. It was laid out there on the streets, streets, you know, metaphorically, on the ground for them. They were in the wilderness. And he even told them on Friday, because the Sabbath was Saturday, on Friday, get twice as much because you're not going to go out there on the Sabbath and collect any. Have enough for today and for tomorrow. Now, don't hoard it. Don't go out there on Monday. When they, you know, when man is out there and try to collect five and six barrels and buckets full, just take enough for what you need for your family, you know. But for God doing that, just, just that alone, giving them water from a rock, you know those stories have been recycled, passed down from generation to generation. The Red Sea, walking across, not on muddy ground, but dry. I mean, we could go on and on on how God has blessed them. And yet they turn their backs on him. Yet they have a godly king that raised his son the right way. And his son still goes out and rebels against what God would have him to do. And the type of man God would have him to be, the type of leader. We can see it in them. But we also have to see it in ourselves. How many times have we transgressed or overstepped a forbidden line? And I don't mean we accidentally done something out of ignorance. Everyone has done that. That's why when you know better, you should correct your behavior and do better. But how many times have we intentionally done something wrong? And we didn't just do it once. We did it over and over and over and over and over again. And you still going to church. You still in the choir. You still preaching. 
You're still teaching. You're still praying to open the service. You're a deacon. You are a staff member at the church. You know what the Bible says. You get the verse of the day sent to your phone every day, but you're still doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. When it comes to God, the same warning that he's given to them, we can say to us, he's warning us as well. God is not a cosmic pushover. God is not weak. God is not passive. God is not a God to be toyed with. Yes, he is rich in grace and mercy. He's so gracious to us, so patient to us, with us, that when he finally does correct us, we actually get mad because we're so used to doing wrong. Now that he makes us do right, we actually mad. I mean, why are you going to stop me now, God? I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been shacking for 20 years. I mean, we have a common law marriage. It's still fornication. It's still adultery. It's still lying. It's still stealing. I don't care that you've been robbing banks and you've been doing it for X amount of time. The only way and reason you've been getting by is because I've been gracious. But there will come a time. This is what he's saying. Verses 4, 5, and 6. There will come a time to where the dam of God's mercy will give way to the flood waters of God's judgment. So that's what I, not Isaiah, excuse me, that's what Jeremiah was trying to tell them. God was giving them a warning. So now let's move on to verses 7, 8, and 9. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now, now let me stop there. Verse 7 is the best that we're going to see from them. They didn't interrupt him. Even in our lesson, I read through the commentary. They didn't cut him off. They didn't shout words foolishly at him. They sat there. They listened attentively. They heard him speaking the words. All these people heard him say it all. They heard what God had to say. Verse 7. Let's read verses 8 and 9. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah made an end of speaking, speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people. We see the priests, the prophets, and all the people took him. They snatched him up, saying, thou shalt die. Literally, the lesson lets us know they were screaming, you need to be put to death. Verse 9. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord? saying, this house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. They started off so well. Sometime the best thing, well, I don't want to say that. I'll say for them, the best thing they could have done was kept their mouth quiet. But when they opened their mouth and they start screaming, he needs to be put to death. Why have you given us this bad prophecy why have you said that this house will be made bad like shiloh don't know exactly what happened at shiloh they knew and they were like how dare you say that's gonna happen to us the the spiritual arrogancy that they had how dare you say that's gonna happen in america you out your mind this is the greatest country in the world we can't have stuff like that happening here this ain't Russia. This ain't China. This ain't Korea. This ain't Africa. This America. That, that's not going to happen to us. You know who we are? This is the greatest democracy in the world. God can build up a nation. And y'all help me with this. God can tear down a nation. Let me, let's, let's go ahead and, 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 and talk Turkey here. They have a wicked king. We saw from verse 1, King Josiah was a godly king. He died. He was killed by the Egyptians, an Egyptian pharaoh. The Egyptian pharaoh set and put his son, Jehoiakim, as a king. Now, let me go ahead and tell you this. Sometimes God's reward to a wicked people is a wicked ruler. Listen, I've had this conversation with, with several people, and they talk politics. I, I, I'm not a political guy. 
Some of the stuff I don't study enough to speak intelligently, so I keep my mouth quiet. If I don't know about foreign policy, I, I, I can't speak intelligently about it. But I hear the complaints on either side. Some going to talk about Trump. Some didn't like Obama. Some didn't like Clinton. Some didn't like Reagan. Some didn't like Bush 1 or Bush 2. The, the list goes on and on. And, and I had this discussion once with some people that were pretty close to me. We had a good relationship. Well, this guy supports this. And, he's, and I said, yeah, yeah, that, that stuff is bad. I said, but have you looked around at our nation? I said, I dare you to go into the office and send out a prayer or send out some scriptures. Somebody's going to say something. You can't pull a child to the side in a classroom who just lost a parent or a sibling or a fellow student. You can't pull that child to the side and pray with them. You'll get in trouble. Don't put the Ten Commandments up in the courtroom. Don't put a nativity scene at the state capitol. Why? Because if you put that up there, then you got to let the church of Satan put their stuff up there. Have you looked around at our country? I said, we're not getting closer to God. We're getting further away from God. And I said the same phrase to them that I just said here a moment ago. Sometimes God's reward to wicked people is a wicked ruler. Oh, you don't want me to be your king? Oh, you, you want to have somebody else to look up to? I'll give you a Solomon. I, I'll give you a Jehoiakim. I'll give you, and I don't want to name any political people because I don't want to spice up one side and down another side. But the point is, God sometimes will give a corrupt leader as his reward to corrupt people. He said, you don't want me? You, you don't want my word? You can't pray in school. You don't want to spank your children because, you know, that's, that's taboo. We're not talking about abuse. We're talking about corporal punishment. You can't do that. You care more about puppies than you care about killing babies in the womb. So I'll tell you what. Here's what we'll do. I'll give you what you want. My reward to you is I'll give you a wicked king. And what God does with the prophet Jeremiah, he lets them know here is exactly what's going to happen. And when God told them through the prophet Jeremiah, rather than look at themselves and say, is this message true? Is this really, is this a true reflection of who we are? Is this a true representation of how far we've slid away from God? Instead of them looking at the mirror and making a correction, they look at the mirror, they get a brick, and they break the mirror. You see, the Bible has a word to describe that. That's called rebellion. They even threatened to kill the messenger, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, if you look at verse 1, it said the word of the Lord came to him under King Jehoiakim. When you get to verse 4, God say, here's what you shall say to them. And guess what? Jeremiah said what God told them to say. So there was no tampering with the message. There was no flaw in the message. As we use the analogy of a sower and the seed and the soil, there's nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with the sower of the seed. The problem was the heart, which is the soul. They just rejected the truth. Now, I'm going to pause and, and hopefully help some preachers out right here. Whenever we stand and we know we've prayed and we know we've studied and people walk out and give funny looks or they criticize the message, sometimes it ain't the preacher. Stay with me here. Sometimes it ain't the Sunday school teacher. Sometimes it's not the pastor. It's not the deacon. It's not the evangelist. Sometimes the problem is just the heart of the people. They reject biblical truth because the time will come where men, women, boys, and girls will not adhere to, listen to, put up with sound doctrine. What Jeremiah gave them was straight from the mouth of the Lord. And what it cost him was his life. It's, they said at the end of verse 8, thou shalt die, meaning you need to be put to death. In verse 9, they say, how dare you tell us this message? How dare you say this is going to happen to us the same way it did to Shiloh? Don't know exactly what it was, but it had to have been so bad 
They remember that. They can make the connection to that. They knew enough about it to say, that won't be us. And even they criticized Jeremiah by saying, how dare you even say that could even happen to us? Now, as we move on to some of these later verses, verses 10 and verse 11, Jeremiah 26, verses 10 and 11. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die. Well, why? For he has prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your ears. Now, did he prophesy against the city? Yes, he did. Did he have a reason to prophesy against the city? Yes, he did. You see, it wasn't the fact that what he said was not pleasing to them, that they're, they're only looking at the surface. This is how sin can blind you. Sinful pride can blind you. They're only focusing on the fact that he said something that wasn't pleasing to our ears. He's saying something to us that is not kind, that doesn't uh, give us a nice, soft, warm, fuzzy feeling. He's not saying nice stuff about us. Never mind the fact that it's true. Just the fact that he's saying it is the issue. Now, 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 now let's talk for a minute. We live in a time just like that today. People, let's, 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 let's talk Christians. People in churches can be more mad when you point out sin than the actual sin itself. Wait a minute. You got this person who's obviously running through the church, really doing damage to the church, really doing wrong, really committing offenses, really, I mean, just causing all type of issues. Well, people can get mad at you for pointing it out, according to scripture, than the actual sin that's taking place itself. That's exactly where they were. Why are you mad at Jeremiah for pointing it out, actually mad at God for pointing it out, than the actual fact that what he's saying is true? You see, we now have the 11th commandment, and I say this, you know, comically, you know, that is, thou shalt be nice. <laughs> Listen, Jeremiah, all he did was give a straightforward message. If you continue the ways you're going, things are not going to be well for you. But if you, if you listen to the Lord, you haven't been. But if you listen to the Lord, then things will go so much better for you. Don't be more upset at the person that points out the wrong, the evil, the sin. Don't be more upset with that person than you are with the actual person who's committing the sin themselves. And I, I, I love to use the analogy of teachers. How many of you that work with children and that are teachers or educators, that the parents are more mad at you for suspending the child that's cussing you out than the actual fact that this sixth grader has been cussing you out? Wait a minute. Wait. I'm just reporting what your child has been doing. And he's been continually doing it so much that it's disrupting the class. And the punishment is he has to go home for a little while. They're more mad at the teacher, the faculty member, the student, or not the student, but the principal, whomever it may be. They're more mad at them than the child that's actually committing the offense. That's what we have here in these two verses. In verses 11, uh, 10 and 11. And they say, because of this, this man is worthy to die. So, so let's, let's have another analogy brought, to, uh, brought forward. How willing or how far are you willing to go for the Lord? Because him taking a stance to do what is right. He said exactly what God said. He didn't go rob a bank. 
He didn't go commit murder. He didn't steal. He didn't break any laws. He actually has his life put on the line, not for doing what is wrong, but for doing what is right. And here we are in our country, in the time we live in, and it may not seem like it, but the price of our obedience to the Lord is not going to go down. It's only going to get higher. The price for our allegiance to God is going to increase and not decrease. Gas used to be, they tell me, 50 cents a gallon, 75 cents a gallon, a dollar a gallon. It, 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 it ain't going back there no more. Oh, yeah, we may have some very sharp drops for whatever reason. I don't know how gas prices are calculated, but however it's done, sometimes the gas prices just go down. But gas is trending up and not trending down. The prices of homes are trending up. It's not trending down. The price to purchase cars is trending up. It's not trending down. And the price to be a Christian, to follow him, not be some closet follower, not be some closet Christian, not be somebody who hides their Christianity under the table and only breaks it out at church on Sunday and possibly Wednesday if you do go. The price to be a real Christian, to stand for the Lord, is going up. Salvation is free. But serving the Lord is going to continually cost you something. And that cost is not going down. And here we can see Jeremiah. They said this man should be put to death because he's uh, prophesying against the city. Verse 12. Let's see how Jeremiah responds. Then spoke Jeremiah unto all the crowd, all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that you have heard. Verse 13. Therefore now you can, you can escape it. You can, you can escape the punishment. It, would all be, it, it can all be a moot point if you just, verse 13, amend your ways and your doings. And obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent of the evil that he has pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seems good and worthy unto you. But know for a certain that if you put me to death, you shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city. And upon the inhabitants thereof, for of a truth, the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words into your ears. Lord, I wish we had more time. We got about three minutes. He said, the Lord sent me to say everything I said. So if you have a problem with the message, I'm just the carrier of the message. I'm not the author of the message. And many times the real problem is not with the teacher, the preacher, the deacon, the pastor, the minister, whomever. The real problem is with the Lord, meaning there's an authority issue and they can't take it out on him. So they take it out on the one that they can see, which is in this case, it was Jeremiah. He said, nah, but listen, I'm not just giving you doom and gloom. I'm not just going to point out where you're wrong. Just like every good message should consist of the same thing here. I'm not just going to point out where you're wrong. I'm also going to show you how you can make it right. Amend your ways. Amend your doings. Obey the Lord. Listen. I don't care what you're involved in. I don't care what your Saturday night was, your Friday night was. I don't care what your weekend excursions were. I don't care what you've done all week, all month, all year. I don't care what you've done your whole life. All of your no's to the Lord can all be made mute, can all be canceled out if you just learn to say yes to him. Yes, to salvation. Yes to Jesus. Yes to what the Lord wants. Yes 
to what his word says. Because don't, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people that can wash their hands of you. And sometimes you can burn a whole bunch of bridges. But there is somebody that you can never sin and get into so deep of a hole that he's not willing to pick you up, to clean you up, to change you. And that's the Lord. He said, if you would just amend your ways, if you would just amend your doings, ch ch change your life, not so much that we can hit a switch and we just turn, but if you just turn over the reins. I I'll, I'll close with this story. I've told it before, but it bears repeating about a couple that took a trip to the Grand Canyon and one of the sites was that not the site, but one of the, uh, uh, um, I guess one of the things they could do was they paid money. They could ride a donkey on the way down to from the top of the Grand Canyon to the bottom. And so as they're going down, they came across some shaky ground. And there's a steep drop off on the side. And one of the guys holding this little mule, he's pulling and tugging. And the guide said, take your hands off the rain. He said, take my hands off. He said, just, just, just take your hands off. And reluctantly and hesitantly, he took his hands off and he fought his instincts and they all made it safely down to the bottom. He said, well, why did you tell me to take my hands off? I never would have thought to do that. Listen, he said, that donkey's been up and down this mountain many times. This is your first time. So the point is, as you've been trying your best to fix it and you're pulling and you're tugging, all God wants you to do when it talks about amending your ways, changing your ways, you got to take your hand off the steering wheel. You have to let go of the reins. You have to let him have control of your life. When it comes to the Lord, you can sign the bottom of that check, and I promise you, he'll never overcharge you. He'll never put you in a bad space. So if you're out there and you just had a horrible year, you just look at the way you've been living, the stuff you've been doing, the stuff you've been putting in your body, the way you've been talking, the way you've been dressing, the stuff you're getting involved in, you're hurting your family, you're hurting your neighbors, you're lying on this person. Your life, if you just honest, you may not ever admit it to anybody, but you know and the Lord know, you know you're not what you're supposed to be. You know you're not doing what you're supposed to do. If you amend your ways, let me say it better. If you just obey his voice, if, if you're a Christian and you're in that situation, if you confess your sins, Lord knows I've had to do this. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're not a Christian, we're not trying to stop you from being an alcoholic. Of, of course, we want you to. But if all you do is stop drinking and never accept Christ, well, that means you're going to hell sober as opposed to drunk. So we can't clean the fish before we catch it. Yes, we can tell you about proper living and, and godly living and walking in the spirit. But we can't do that until we teach you about a man named Jesus that walked and talked like a man. And late one Friday, he died like a man. And early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. Paul says it best, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the, the dead, then you shall be saved. So as it relates to amending your ways, if you're a Christian, fall on your knees, repent. Father, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have behaved that way. I know better. I know I shouldn't be doing this. I know I shouldn't. And guess what? God knows how to wash his hands. And as the Old Testament said, he takes your sin and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to rise again. It, it, there, there's no submarine that can find it. There's no expert diver that's going to dig down there and bring up what you've done. Man doesn't do that. They'll bury the hatchet, but they'll mark the spot. Because I never know when I have to bring this thing up in your face again to put you in your place. That's how man does it. But I'm so glad God is not like man. Because when God is done with it, he's done with it. So to every Christian out there who's gone astray, who's gotten outside of where they should be, take it from me. When you call him and you call him right, 
God can remove the stain and shame and guilt from your sin. He can restore you. If you're not a Christian, if you accept Christ today, guess what? It's as if all that stuff that you've done has never, ever taken place in God's eyes. He clothed you and covers you in the righteousness of Christ. And on Calvary's cross, he poured out his judgment on Jesus. He treated him as if he had lived my life and your life. And now he looks at you as if you have lived his life. It's called the great substitution. So I want to encourage you to give yourself to him today. I, I, I pray that these themes have been made clear and plain from today's lesson. It's my prayer that somebody has gotten to know him. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close here now. Time has kind of gotten away from me, but we will be back in about 20 minutes or so with our morning message. We're going to continue with the sermon series entitled The Preeminence of Doctrinal Preaching, and we will be back in Acts chapter 4. So I'll give you all an opportunity, and I'll take it myself to refill my coffee, and I can't wait to see you all again. And so go ahead and get yourself comfortable. Get on out to bed if you're still laying in the bed. Get your coffee, get your milk, get your orange juice, get your turkey sausage, and get your eggs scrambled, and get your little food in your mouth, and come back by 1040, 1045, and we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, God bless you, and I can't wait to see you shortly.